I'm 11 years old um, and well I know Mike very well because I've known him more than half of my life. Um, I think we uh, realised quite early on there was something different about Polly's um, facial structure. My husband was probably more anxious about it than I was initially. Um, but then when she was about eight months old, I went to the dentist with the other two children and popped her in at the end and he was pretty blunt with me that there was something wrong with her and said, you know, this is a malformation of the jaw and she'll need surgery when she's 18 to 21 once she stopped growing, but there's nothing you can do about it now. So just to kind of go away and leave it as it was, it was obviously very upsetting as a parent to be told that there's something wrong with your tiny, tiny baby. It wasn't just the aesthetics. It was really clear to us that her, her, she couldn't eat some foods because her, her, her teeth were upside down. She couldn't bite hard bread. I could see that longer term there were going to be functional issues and probably sleep issues because of the way she breathed. We were eventually referred by a GP to the um, maxillocranial facial unit in our local hospital. He again said, you know, there's nothing we can do for her at all and we didn't we didn't really think much more of it we we'd been as far as we could see to the top people in the country and had the top advice and you know it wasn't good the the the, the prognosis but we didn't have anything we couldn't do anything about it and we could already see that it was going to have a major impact on her kind of um personality or confidence because she was going to look so different from her um siblings and friends there was a time when someone asked me what's wrong with your teeth. I didn't really know, I just said they're kind of a bit off. Just when they think there is nothing more that they can do, they coincidentally run into a cranial osteopath who tells them about orthotropics. It was actually at a funeral that we met this woman and she said, well, what have you been told you can do? And I said, well, we've been told we can't do anything. And she said, well, um, you know, you, you can, you, there is something you can do. There are people who treat this um, kind of malf malformation very early and it can be sorted out. And so as we drove away from where we'd been, I was just straight on my phone Googling, you know, and, and then I unfolded this whole world of orthotropics. So when I met, first met Rosie and Polly, I, I, was, I, was, I was shocked. I can't, I can't describe how... It, I'm not going to start again because I, I, even now it's I, I just even recalling when they came back now it's it was a shock to my system I mean a, a young girl who was so class three as we said in the tray I mean, sticky out jaw the man you know at what five years old Polly needed Something. I mean, what could you, how could you leave a child like that? What was it going to do to her? So how can you leave someone on the scrap heap? I, uh, yes, I would say I was emotional when I first met her. It was quite a full-on meeting where he was like, yeah, this is the worst I've ever seen. She's going to be the biggest challenge I've ever had. I'm going to have to change my treatment plan to deal with her. Oh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and I, I then evolved it on... Polly. It was, Polly's one of those cases that will always go down in, in my evolutionary history. The number of times that Rosie, her mother, would phone me up late in the evening and say, oh, we've had a problem with this. I would talk her through and I'd say, right, be at the clinic seven o'clock in the morning before things start. Give me a nice hour, hour and a half to get things done. She would literally pick Polly up out of bed, move her into the car, strap her in, throw a blanket over her, arrive at 7.30 in the morning at the clinic, wake Polly up, and I would start going through the problem with Rosie, and then we would revisit the situation. We, we move mountains. It's maybe a little bit out there, but I couldn't see any way that it could hurt Polly. I couldn't, I couldn't see, the, the worst case scenario was that we stopped treatment and 
things just went back. I wasn't doing anything that hurt her. There was no teeth removal. There was no real intervention. It was just a bit of growth sort of nudging to get something to grow and a bit of postural work. I couldn't, I couldn't see there was any negative when, and, and the potential positive was so huge. The first thing we needed to do with Polly is gain some change in the physical shape. So we widen the top jaw, the bottom jaw a little to a lesser extent, and we literally pulled the top jaw forwards so that she was more normal. Within six months, she, her teeth had gone from, I think, minus 12 millimetres to, which is where her bottom jaw was sticking forward from her top jaw by 12 millimetres, so that's big. Um, and But in six months we had her teeth the right way around. So really all that happened was that her, her tongue was being held in the wrong position. And so her upper jaw had never really grown. It wasn't that her bottom jaw was particularly huge, it was just that her upper jaw had never grown. So it was very easy, once you sort of triggered it to grow, it just grew. I had like a full on headgear around my head for a bit and I would have eating braces and now I've moved on to just having a brace in the night. It was just a new part of our lifestyle and it was a definite lifestyle choice to take up this treatment. It's not something you can just, you know, you can't just put it on and forget about it. It's, it's there every single day um, and you have to be aware of it and, and know that you're going to have to drive to Croydon or wind the brace or remember the brace, but it just becomes a habit. It's just part of our lives now. If I forget my brace, it's almost like a part of me. Like I'll be like, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I will be like, where's my brace? And then I'll put it in and I'll go back to sleep. It sort of helps me go to sleep now, like a teddy or something, yeah. As I say, all my patients are my children. Um, Polly particularly so. She, she's taught me a great deal. And for me to see her flower now, as a young girl, it's, uh, what can you say? You know, it's like, there's my child, <laughs> you know? Um, I remember her entering this competition to design a, um, something for the bath. And she came second, and I a shame, I thought her idea was great. But there she was explaining it to me, and I just had this overwhelming sense of um, <laughs> fatherliness. I, what else can you describe it? You know, it's, um, yeah, no, I'm, I, you know, I'm just so happy every time I see her, you know? Pretty, outgoing, bubbly young girl. Yeah, I mean, Polly is always being able to take over the world. So she was so little that she was still that glorious bundle of bombastic kind of craziness. But I think we have prevented any insecurities kicking in because of the teeth. I don't think she had got to a point where she would have, uh, that would have happened. Whereas I think, so I think we've just kept the original uh, Polly. Uh, we. Whereas if we hadn't done this, I strongly suspect that she would have been much less self-confident and felt much less comfortable in groups of people. She's very outgoing and, you know, gregarious and, yeah, fills the room with, uh, with you know, her humour. And it's, it's lovely because we know that that could have not been. I'm much more confident than I would have been. Like, now I can like go out in public and stuff. It's I didn't ever worry about it because I was too young, but I think it might have been more of a struggle to like go out in public um, and mess around and do stuff and just be n not worried about my face. It would have been more of a struggle with an abnormal face. <laughs> so yeah. It was actually at a funeral that we met this woman and 
My husband and I say that it was uh, the person whose funeral we were at's last sort of gift to us was that she she gave us this message and whatever you do or don't believe in it, 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 it I mean categorically this has changed all our lives and and it did seem really wrong that we weren't ever told that this was a possibility like not everybody could either afford to do it or want to do it or be bothered to do it or have the commitment or whatever or the children might respond differently but we weren't even told that this was a that this was something that could happen and that uh, that just feels wrong and yes I mean thank goodness that we were given that opportunity and now when I see children in their teens who haven't had those opportunities and who are going through classic courses on street and you know their parents may have chosen that path for them but I wouldn't have done and I'm so glad I didn't have to and I think as a patient of Mike's you have to become very aware that what you're doing is slightly out there and you don't you absolutely don't try and persuade anyone else that they should be doing it as well as you but you but you have a kind of steely confidence in that you know that everything he's saying makes sense it's just it's not the norm and maybe there always has to be somebody out there challenging that norm because that's how progress is made right if you don't if you don't question what's currently the norm how will anyone ever progress and we were just in this instance really lucky to find that person who was challenging the norm <laughs>